I had been noticing and commenting and writing about the global debt bubble since about 1998, when Asia fell apart on a debt bubble. And I, and that was the Asian crisis. And I started noticing the same trends were happening in, in the West and Japan was also quite far ahead. So I was getting very worried about the financial system. Then 2008 came along and we blew up the financial system and the answer was to print money. Um, and then 2012, we almost lost Europe as well, based on the same issue, debt. Over that period, I started looking around for an answer. How can we avoid this? People have looked at gold, but that was only part of an answer. How do you actually build a financial system? So I started thinking about, could I create the world's safest bank? One that hold, held treasuries directly with the Federal Reserve, let's say, or whatever it may be. So I, I spent about a year on that journey. And during that journey, one of my um, friends came to me and said, have you looked at Bitcoin? So that was 2013, early 2013. So I very quickly understood you know, what its um, promise had, particularly blockchain and the scarcity value. And I probably wrote the first ever stock to flow paper uh, from a macro perspective in 2013 about how I valued Bitcoin versus gold, for example, using stock to flow analysis. Um, and I f first started investing it back in 2013. And so I'd followed the journey of crypto and, you know, I learned about some of the other protocols and started getting interested in the whole space. And by about 2015, I'd started realizing that everything in the world was going to get tokenized in the end uh, and that this was going to be a predominant business model. But the Bitcoin price after the, the bull run in 2017, you know, was coming down. And so I, I had got out during that bull run too early. Um, the forking wars had freaked me out a bit. So I got out, but I've made a lot of money in it. Um, or made some good returns in it. And then I was following the space briefly. But my hypothesis was that when the next recession comes, we're going to have to test all of this all over again. The financial system, debt, central bank printing, all of it. And so I was waiting for that. And my work and analysis suggested it was coming in 2020 um, and had it started in 2019. So I was then starting to get much more focused on crypto. I, there was a lot of other macro things going on. The pandemic hit, um, which obviously accelerated the process and now made it the biggest economic event of all of our lifetimes. So the answer was going to be, if my hypothesis was right, the biggest monetary experiment in all recorded history. That had to be the offset to this. I was then looking at the chart of Bitcoin and it was forming this perfect big triangle pattern, which is a nice consolidation pattern, usually that precedes a breakout. Mm -hmm. And it backed into the middle of this triangle in March 2020 as everybody panicked and all risk assets sold. And that was the time I said, this is the opportunity. You know, there's only one way for this to go. It's either going to zero, which was almost no chance, or this was the start of the move. So I started buying Bitcoin then. Um, then I really went very long when it broke 10,000, which was the triangle. Um, and then over the course of the year I got to 100% of my liquid net worth by about August last year. Wow. Um, that was all in Bitcoin. And then I broadened that out and um, increased my Ethereum exposure by about October, thinking that Ethereum was actually going to massively outperform for, for a couple of years. So increased my Ethereum exposure and then added a basket of other tokens and then took some macro bets in the future of where this is all going, which I think is communities, social tokens, um, that kind of use of NFTs outside of just artwork, but but attaching assets to the blockchain and also the metaverse. So that's where I am now. And so I'm, I'm now mainly, I think about 55% Ethereum, 25% Bitcoin, and the rest spread amongst uh, a bunch of different tokens. Bitcoin has these two attributes. One is the store of value. So it's like gold because it's a scarce asset, like artwork and other things, real estate. But it has this other thing, which is this call option on the future. What could it be? Mm. What could it be used for? What could this technology be used for? And that's really the network effect that is Bitcoin. And it's the same for the whole crypto space. So if it really was going to be a store of value and the central banks were printing an unprecedented amount of money, then like equity prices, real estate prices, gold prices, it should go up in value. But it should go up a lot more because it has this call option 
on a potential future financial system too. So that was really what I saw. And the chart started playing out exactly that way where Bitcoin started outperforming every other asset on earth and it became no point to own any other assets. Now, this year has been less that. Bitcoin has kind of kept pace with other assets, but um, you know, in a weird way, it went up a lot first and then came down a lot. Mm -hmm. But um, over time, it's generally outperformed everything. And what about Ethereum? Why why increase your exposure so much so that Because it like, even trumps I, Bitcoin? In October, I started seeing the chart of Ethereum versus Bitcoin and looked like it was going to start outperforming, just a chart pattern and a hunch. And then I started digging into, okay, how do you value Bitcoin and Ethereum? So we've had the stock to flow model, but really what it was to me was also a network and you use something called Metcalfe's law to value a network, which is basically a network has value proportionate to the number of people on the network and the number of interconnections they have with each other. So I could see that in Bitcoin and you could pretty much prove it out by putting like number of active wallet addresses um, and the price of Bitcoin on a chart and you basically get a very high correlated answer. And I could see people attacking anybody who talked about Ethereum or other tokens online. So I'm like, hmm, I need to find out how you price Ethereum because I have a feeling it's exactly the same as Bitcoin. And what was interesting is I used the same mechanism and it's priced exactly the same way. But what was more surprising is the adoption of Ethereum was much faster than that of Bitcoin at the same stage. So I'm like, wow. And then you start realizing the number of things being built in it, the applications, the number of developers involved, and the speed of the increase of the number of users. So there's a lot of interconnections plus a lot of users that was going to become very valuable. So then add a chart onto that again, chart of Ethereum looked like it was going to break out and that gave me everything I needed. Mm. And how, how are those charts looking now? Well, they continue to show that, you know, even... Um, Ethereum has been having more volume in certain days than Bitcoin has. The wallet address growth is faster than Bitcoin. In every way, it's outperforming Bitcoin, except in market cap. I think it will, it, we call it the flippening when, when Ethereum is larger than the market cap of Bitcoin. That's nothing to say that I don't believe in Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Bitcoin is a different thing to Ethereum. Many hardcore Bitcoin believers think that all applications will be built on the Bitcoin blockchain. But I think that's more a hope than a reality. The reality is many different ecosystems will, will get traction for different things. And Ethereum right now has DeFi, NFTs, social tokens all on it. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have to be money. The next part of the equation comes with the introduction of the uh, EIC-1559 token, which essentially um, lowers the supply of Ethereum by burning Ethereum. And then there's the ETH 2.0, where we move to proof of stake, which again, A, will lower the gas fees, but also will, will uh, lower supply even further. So it becomes a super scarce asset with massive use. So probability <laughs> is it's going to do pretty well. Yes, my target is still remains between 200 and 400,000. For like, in, in what time? Probably the next, I think the cycle extends somewhat. So I'll give it. I'll give it the next 12 months. And for ETH? At a minimum 20,000. And and would that mean the flippening would happen? No, not quite. Later. Yeah, not quite. I don't think the flippening happens this time around. I think it happens mm. maybe over time. Um, mm -hmm. So let's see, but it could do. Maybe the ETH 2.0 drives the flippening. Maybe it's a short-term boost. We have huge speculative blow-off, collapse. You know, you know what crypto is like. It's... You know, it's not very good. predictable in short term yeah. time horizon. So mm -hmm. it kind of goes where it goes. But, you know, if you say to me in, in five years time, does ETH have a larger market cap than Bitcoin? Probably. <laughs>